Welcome to RV Talk Radio. Here we talk about RV living, RV lifestyles, and RV travel. We also celebrate the RV lifestyle that gives us the chance to do outdoor activities that we couldn't do in a normal lifestyle. So thanks for joining us. Grab yourself a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, and let's talk about RVs. Hello everybody, this is Rob Scribner. Welcome to episode 60. Today we're going to talk about modulating. (laughs) Yes, modulating. That's what I'm going to call it. The way that we're going to do RVing and other activities and try to make them all work together. That's my goal on this show and I'm sticking to it. I got a great email from Richard March who... uh, wanted to talk about his RV. He was going, he's getting ready to start RVing full time. And he's an avid fisherman, which I was, but I don't do as much as I used to. I, yes, I enjoy trout fishing, fly fishing, and my favorite's always salmon fishing. And of course, I like little things like crabbing and uh, shrimping. But uh, yeah, what a dilemma. I definitely want to talk about this. So what he brought up was, okay, I have an RV, and I'd like to have a boat with me. I want to take a boat. And so, boy, that's that was a tough one. Shuri and I, we've talked about this a lot. And we actually had to change our, our process. So I want to talk about what I call modulation. Is if you're going to be an RV traveler... Uh, it gets kind of harder, but if you're kind of an RV traveler going from one favorite place for a while to another favorite place for a while to another favorite place for a while, or maybe the concept of uh, being a snowbird where you take your RV in one location because of the weather and then take your RV to another RV uh, location because of the weather. Um, and I guess you could also even do it if you had a home and you were snowbirding from there. So. This is what Sherry and I kind of call <laughs> modulating is we, I mean, uh, we can take things like uh, a float tube or things like that for uh, uh, trout fishing and stuff. But those are real limited to small lakes without a lot of wind and stuff like that. So what he's talking about is he wants to take a boat with him. And my answer is <laughs> I have never found a good answer for that. <laughs> Now, for example, I've been telling you about the things at Lake Powell, and I'm seeing guys with RVs uh, bringing in boats behind their RV, and and, uh, Lord knows how they manage it, but they launch their boat uh, with an RV on the boat ramps, and it's like, I don't know how they manage it, but it looks kind of tough, but I think those are more for the weekend warriors. Now, don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with weekend warriors, but what's kind of nice about them is they are coming from their house, they're in their RV, they hook up the boat, they go to their favorite place to go fishing, like Lake Powell, for example, or Pleasant Lake, whatever, down here in Arizona. And then they don't necessarily need their car, so they can come up with their RV and have the boat on the back and then just stay at the resort and they're not going anywhere, so they're good to go. But that's kind of not what I think uh, Richard is talking about. Sherry and I always wanted to find a way to get our boating in. And we kind of did it the first time we uh, full-time back in 2006 and 2007. Uh, we had a custom weld boat. So it was a 21-foot fishing boat. So I can relate to what you're talking about, Richard. And uh, what we did is we kept it at somebody's property in, in Central Oregon. And then uh, when we were in that area, we would use the boat then. But I think Sherry and I have kind of redefined how we want to do boating. And plus, I'm adding in the fact that I've always been an avid fisherman, so I always thought boats should be a workhorse, a a tool. Um, Kind of how, I probably the same way I think about RVs, is I'm not in love with my RV. My RV is a tool. It's a resource that allows me to do stuff. Or give me a lifestyle I haven't wasn't able to have before because I had a uh, mortgage. But I had to change my attitude about a boat too. Um, I got our boat as a pleasure craft, 
And so it's not a fishing machine. I can fish from it, and I'm going to, but it's not designed for that. It's a um, party boat, if you want to call it that. Um, so what throws me on that is is being down here trying to learn how to enjoy the water to play in not just the fish in but the play in too is a new concept for me and Sherry totally and it's kind of hard uh, I don't even know what kind of toys to put on the boat because I got grandkids now and stuff so my first test is coming up next weekend actually when I uh, our kid, all of us and the kids are going up to uh, Paige uh, for the weekend we're staying in motels the mot- the boat is already moored and set to go and so we're going to do some activities to go you know, see some really cool things in Page and then uh, the following day we're going to take the kids out on the boat on Lake Powell this will be basically the first test for me and Sherry to learn how to use a boat as a toy uh, uh, something different so the concept I'm kind of going to bring up is maybe before you if you already have a boat I don't know what kind of boat you have, but you might want to look at your boat as a second recreational vehicle. And the reason I say that is you're probably towing a car or a truck as your transportation. And so you go, well, then how can I have a boat and pull a car and the whole works? And I suggest that you turn your boat into a second destination, a snowbird destination, whatever you want to. So you may have to change the kind of boat you have and then place it either in the water or in a place near the water that has storage where you can put it, like ours is on a trailer. If we decide that the weather's too cold in Page in the wintertime, we can pull the boat, put it in storage, have very uh, small amount of rent to, to store it, until the weather improves. And so the same concept I'm suggesting to you is is you need to probably look at modulating yourself where you have a boat that you want to put in your favorite areas of the fish and leave it there and then also make arrangements to either moor it or have a place to store it in that certain location. And then commute from your RV, wherever that is, in your car to that location and use your boat as a second RV. Only difference is it floats. So um, I've even, Sherry and I also slept in our boat a couple of times in parking lots. So we used it as an RV if you want to look at it that way. Tough, tough thing when you got toys that you want to have. And the same thing applies to other toys like jet skis and, and paddle boards and, and uh, other toys like that are a little hard to jockey around when you are RVing. So I have to suggest that you get into a modulation <laughs> modules where you put your different kinds of toys in different locations that you enjoy and make that part of your travel journey. Uh, in our case, Sherry and I are locked in in one position um, with the RV, but that doesn't mean the boat has to. So at least we can get, a, if we can't do the traveling we want to do in the RV right now, then at least on the weekends and extended weekends, we have the second location to go to, our mini snowbird thing, to go to another location and enjoy the environment, whether it's playing in the water or fishing in the water or just tourism in the water. Uh, or if I don't even want to do a water activity but want to be near my boat, my boat can be my RV for that weekend to allow me to go do things like go look at the Grand Canyon and stuff. So I hope that helps. Um, it's kind of hard. I mean, Sherry and I fought this for years of trying to find a way to, gosh, it would just be great if you could just attach a third trailer onto your trailer. Um, but you know, that's, I think there's a couple states that'll let you do that. And I've actually seen it in like Montana, but not practical, not practical at all. But anyway, modulation (laughs) modules is the way I describe it is put your toys, spread them out all over it. It could be in different states. It doesn't have to be nearby. Just change your paradigm that 
the items don't have to be near you, that you have to touch and feel them all the time. Spread them out to different areas, different states, wherever you want them, and then work your schedule, work your travels around your toys. And and then here's the other thing that been kind of my complaint about RVing a little bit is I, I have folks get to me saying, well, RVing, you're not talking about RVing all the time, Rob. You're talking about fishing or you're talking about uh, sailing. You're talking about boating. And it's like, I suggest that if we open our paradigms and just realize that the whole RV lifestyle doesn't include, always have to include the RV 24 7, is use the RV as a tool, but uh, get used to the fact that the RV, well, one, will reduce our overhead big time to allow you to do things you want to do. And I've been getting letter after letter after letter about people saying, yeah, because I've been complaining about this. If you haven't heard earlier uh, episodes that that I've had people actually tell me that I'm drifting away from the RV lifestyle. And I'm telling you, I'm embracing it big time. And uh, and I'm, I'm inviting everybody else out is get an RV and, and reduce your overhead and, and, and learn how to live more prudent. And that's a word somebody wanted me to use. Be more prudent with your with your funds so you can uh, play and relax and do the things you've always wanted to do without the heavy mortgage and responsibility of owning a home or apartment. RVing is flying to places you want to go. RV lifestyle is cruising to those places you've always wanted to do. RVing is the opportunity to go see other countries and and uh, go across the borders and go see things you've never seen before. RVing is boating. RVing is sailing. RVing is hiking. RVing is all that stuff. Thanks to the RV and allowing us to take uh, what we used to call middle class income, now we're just kind of, I'm beginning to wonder if there's even a middle class anymore, is we're all struggling to try to get by between all the different things that cost so much money, including health care and things I always bark about. But anything we can do to make a living comfortable and still enjoy our lives and live for the now, that's what RVing is all about. And if our advice about Taking your toys and modulate them or make them modules and put them in different places works for you. You might have to change up the things you have. Maybe get a different kind of boat or get different kinds of or a special trailer to store your uh, jet skis or whatever, or paddle boards or canoes and kayaks. We can all do that stuff, but you don't necessarily have to have them all with you at 24-7. Change your paradigm. Change the concept. Go play more, guys. I also got a pretty good uh, email from Jason Carr um, talking about how I've been kind of talking about the different levels of income and people, uh, whether they're stealth camping or different types of living. And and he suggested, and I used it earlier, that I should probably use the word people trying to live more prudent or with... Uh, uh, just because you might be middle class or making good money to little, uh, live in a stealthy kind of lifestyle or uh, reducing your overhead doesn't make you like low income or, lo- or low class. And I totally agree. Um, and, I, and if I send that impression, I, I apologize. Uh, I like the RV lifestyle. I think we're middle class if you want to define it. Um, and I like to be more prudent with our money, so this lifestyle works really good for Sherry and I because it takes the load off of what we do make and allows it to us to apply it to the things we want to do at our age. And uh, I couldn't do that if I had the responsibility of a mortgage and, and upkeeping a property and, and the equipment to do so. And so I'm so grateful to be an RVer and, and living the RV lifestyle. And I, I think we qualify of uh, what they would call the middle class. Now, I also referred to the fact that there's folks that are living on minimal amounts of income, and that's cool too. And that's just legitimately just trying to make a living, 
people have had situations and divorces or health issues and scraping by in the RV lifestyle is another way to help make their lives more pleasant. Uh, there is kind of that other lifestyle of like, I want to do this and travel all over, but I want you to pay for it. <laughs> and that one is probably one I am trying to refer to, but um, uh, I haven't done that successfully. And because uh, there's kind of two types, there's kind of like the channels out there that are doing shows and stuff, and they're they have just like us a, a support button, or they have uh, Patreon, and and we consider that tips or an opportunity to have income come in from if we're doing something cool and you like it, it's, it's a tip jar. And then there's others that totally rely on it and they'll literally break down in the middle of nowhere with a transmission out or something get on the internet and start begging for funds and, and believe it or not people send it to them and uh, they're not uh, they're not contributing at all they just seem to be taking and it's like I want you to pay for my lifestyle and uh, that's the kind of ones that I kind of I think I've been targeting a little bit, and I apologize if I hit folks that are low income. Which low income is that just happens. Um, there's so many ways that it could happen, um, and and it's uncontrollable. But they're still trying and giving their 110 percent to um, you know, have a nice lifestyle. And the way they found to do it is using RVs as a place to live to bring down their in, their uh, overhead so they can do some enjoyable things in life. Life doesn't have to be work, 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 work. Um, there's a balance. And so um, anyway, so I hope that defines my stand a little bit. And of course, there's always that six, you know, one percent of the people have got all the money and it's like, hey, would just send a couple grand my way. I'd, I'd love it. <laughs> anyway, that ain't going to happen. And I'm not going to win the lottery, even though I try. But, you know, maybe I should, you know, law of attraction, I should send it out there saying, hey, I'm going to win the lottery. But, no, realism is, no, I'm not going to win any lotteries. Two is I just need to make our, our funds that we make, no matter what people make, make it go as far as you can and live for the now when you can. And also think about the future. And that makes me very grateful for the, once again, a letter that came in to uh, to um, address something that might have got under someone's skin. And I, I apologize for that. I don't necessarily, I like to bring up subjects that can stir a conversation. But uh, anyway, but if it seems like I'm one-sided one way or the other, I try to stay neutral because I want to hear both sides. I am open-minded to all sides of it. So uh, thank you very much for that uh, that note too. And right now I'm going to urge you, please, if you've got things you want us to talk about, things you want to debate about, or things you want to laugh about, <laughs> send us a note. Uh, you can go to RV Talk Radio, go to the comment button there, and if you send a note there, it's private. Nobody sees it except us. You can also email me directly at rob at rvtalkradio.com. Or you can go to any of our Facebook. Um, RV Talk Radio has got its own Facebook page, and so does RV Travel Buddy. And just go to the top section, you'll see where it says Message. You just press that, send us a little note, and it actually comes right to my cell phone um, almost live. So we may even start conversa you know, a conversation right off the bat. Uh, other, if it's something more in-depth, we'll probably find the right time to address that. But anyway, yeah, give us a holler. We love this stuff. We've had... Those are two super comments, and we get other comments too. I don't talk about them all, but um, the one I have been getting a lot of confirmation of people saying, Rob, you're on target. RVers is not just RVing. RVers is, um, I think, J uh, and Jazz. Uh, he was like, I'm going to Europe. Does that make me a non RVer? <laughs> And I just laugh. I go, cool, man. Um, that's something I'd love to go to, go do too, you know. And anyway, uh, and there's others uh, going across the border and, and enjoying uh, resorts over there. And the reason they can do it is they keep their costs down and they can spend money on that kind of stuff. Um, anyway, just example when Sherry and I went up to get the boat and all those motels uh, stuff. It cost us probably a good. 
$1,500 plus or minus, I think it's more than that, for all those motels. Oh, Lord. Talk about expensive motels. That's why I love this module-type living where you can put your boat in another place. Now I can go to Page. I don't have to pay for a motel room. I've got a slip set up. I'll tell you that it's around $350 a month to keep my boat in the water in this great place. And all I have to do is stay in a motel room one day and a half to pay for that. So if I want to go to Page two or three times a month, I paid for it, the motels right off the bat. And I can cook my own food on the boat if we won't really want to, but we still eat out. The other thing is <laughs> when we're bored, Sherry and I go to casino, and we end up wasting money doing that too. So we weren't busy enough. And so now we have one more module, whether it's a fishing boat or whether it's a cruise boat like ours or Maybe uh, maybe you want to buy a second RV and go put it in another location and not even mess around with transporting them. Just drive your car from one location to the other. Put one in storage. Cheap, cheap, cheap way to go and have nice place to live at all the locations that you go to. And you don't get hammered by motel prices and things like that. So there you go. So I want to talk about something kind of personal and kind of cute. <laughs> and uh, I can't help it. It's just adorable. Is my daughter and and my son too. I mean, they're just great kids. Anyway, so of course they have kids now. And my kids aren't kids anymore. They're in their 30s. So anyway, <laughs> my daughter is, you know, is the one that kind of made us put the boat up at Lake Powell. It's her fault. And it, was, and it turned out great. So anyway, so she's aiming us as we're driving down, doing all these things, getting this boat ready in the last two weeks. And the following weekend's coming up, Labor Day weekend uh, for us. And uh, we're going up to Page, and we're going to have the kids, our kids, with their our grandkids. And the littlest one is four years old. And so I know my daughter, she's going, you're going to go... Uh, up to a lake and you're going to be on a boat and and you could go fishing and anyway so she's she goes to the walmart and she's getting a few things that um, we told her we needed you know make sure the kids have some water toys and things like that and i had to get a, another uh, life preserver to make sure that fit him really well and so she takes this picture of him looking at uh kids fishing poles and I don't know why that just just broke my heart. <laughs> and my daughter took a picture at the same time. His eyes lit up because he's never been fishing before. I mean, they live in Phoenix and they do have places they can go fishing. But I mean, really, I mean, he's never what he's going to see next weekend. He would have never had the opportunity ever. To go, you know, right away at least. I mean, eventually it would happen. To go out in a boat and actually, uh, and and by the way, Lake Powell's got lots of little, all kinds of fish in it. It's got stripers, uh, small and largemouth bass, and I guess it's got trout in it. And I believe it's got catfish too. But uh, I'm not a person who wants to catch. I like to catch that stuff, but I'm a catch and release kind of person. And I'll teach my kids and grandkids the same way. Well, I, have, I taught my kids that way too. Not to be greedy, just enjoy the environment and try to be easy on the uh, on the fish and try to release them unharmed. Anyway, so <laughs> I can't wait to see. And I know I, you know, a four year old doesn't have the patience, and I know, but it's got to be adorable just to see him with his new little fishing pole. And there's a place at like Powell at the marina that's actually sectioned off to allow people to fish, and it's out of the way and it's just made for just fishing and <laughs> and i hope he gets a chance and if we don't get a total chance this coming weekend i mean it, obviously the boat's up there for quite a while until we decide to pull it he'll get other opportunities but i don't know what was so darn cute about that i can't wait to see him and i'm i hope i get to be his little role model as i want to go fishing with grandpa type thing now, I have two older grandkids, too, that are um, step-grandkids, and I love them to death, but um, they haven't known me that long, 
and they've been Phoenix kind of kids for a long time. So, um, you know, fishing's not a real high priority to them. So I'm kind of like a square bah humbug. Okay, but the little one, uh, he's totally influenced by all the new things he gets exposed to. And all three kids are great kids. Um, and and uh, uh, anyway, but it's just that picture that I, my daughter showed me and my text thing of him staring at those fishing poles and touching them and I guess once and she says I couldn't help it I had to buy him one and so I guess he was using it and fishing in the car fishing at Walmart um, anyway so I'm sure my daughter she's famous about building it up a little bit so it's going to be really cute just plain old cute to see this little four year old um, my uh, grandson Kai uh having a sh I hope we can give him an opportunity to try to catch a fish <laughs> anyway but he's going to be so overwhelmed with the boat and the, all the things he's never seen before um and I'm sure the older boys too are uh, should have a good time so they're going to be more of they're really into swimming so they're going to really enjoy the boat as a a party boat when I say party boat is it's designed with a giant swim step in the back to go swimming um you go into the little coves you anchor and you just play in the water to your heart's content and then you can go out on the beach uh all these little coves and dry off and there's warm temperatures 80s and so uh anyway um uh, all the kids will have a good time but i am quite anxious and i hope i catch some video of my uh, littlest one uh getting his first opportunity to fish with his brand new fishing poles <laughs> Anyway, a little personal story there, but you got to love it. Well, this is also something else I wanted to talk about is, and yeah, it's kind of personal in a way. It's about my truck. And I, I want to, I'm saluting my truck. This is my salute to my truck. And the reason I want to say that is my truck is a 2002 uh, F350 Ford diesel, uh, dually, one ton, uh, not full wheel drive, two wheel drive, and it's got the 7.3 diesel in it, and it's the last of that model or that year that they use that engine. And I am crossing, and I think I just did crossed, I had to, uh, the 200,000 mile mark on that. And so you got to admit, I mean, I didn't really say it out loud, but I was a little worried about driving all the way up to Washington, 15, almost 2,000 miles when I got up there, and then driving another 2,000 miles back, pulling a gigantic boat that, um, uh, you know, it was a lot of weight in that boat. And yes, there's bigger boats, you know, and by the way, it's the same way. You can buy an RV and then bring it in, be the newest RV, and then the next guy that pulls up has a newer and bigger one. And the same things with boat. I get a boat, and it's like I get it. And it looks humongous to me, and I put it in the slip. And the two boats on both sides of me are bigger, and so it makes mine like, well, it doesn't look that big. Well, it was to me, it was a lot of boat to be hauling down the freeway. But anyway, getting back to the point is my truck performed awesome, just pure awesome. And it, and and I don't recommend a lot of products. I mean. But I got to tell you, I've had my truck since 2006, 2005, and I bought it with 10,000 miles on it. Kind of a sad story of how I got it, but um, totally ready for a fifth wheel. And it's, I've had a few things I've had to fix on it, just basic things. Uh, um, but, uh I mean, very little work I've had to really do on it. I think the most expensive thing I usually spend on that thing is switching out tires. You know, so you got a lot of tires. And a good truck tire costs money. Anyway, but I got to tell you, if you can ever get a hold of a truck, with, especially with low mileage, that has the Fords that have the 7.3 engine on it, I got to tell you, that has been the most impressive truck in my lifetime. And I've had GMCs. I've had other Fords before, and uh, I had a Dodge once, and uh, nothing compares to this truck I got now. It just starts, it runs, it pulls, it works, it runs, it starts, it 
does its job, and I just get out there, and it's very rare that I ever go out there and it tells me I'm not going to perform for you. It did once when I first got down here to Arizona. It told me that the batteries were shot, and with this hot weather, it killed them immediately, and I had to go get new tire, new uh, batteries put in. I've had to do that twice in its lifetime. So, hey, if it wants batteries, it's going to get batteries. <laughs> it has served me well. It pulls my fifth wheel, pulls the boat. It's pulled, this is the second generation of fifth wheel that I've had. Plus, I had trailers in between that. And it's just been a great workhorse. So, I don't know, if you guys are looking for a truck and you happen to come across a, a F-350 Ford before 2002 that has the 7.3 diesel engine snag it <laughs> and if somebody's silly enough to sell it <laughs> uh, snag it I'm telling you it's performed great I've broken the 200,000 mark in mine and it's just keeps running and uh, I, I know that I keep thinking well should I get go and I'll get rid of it and get another one but I'm watching some of these shows and these guys have got to put this deaf stuff into their I don't know what that stuff is but it well I know what it's for but uh, the new trucks have got to have it the older trucks don't have them um, and I keep hearing about check engine lights coming on and it's like that doesn't sound like a dependable rig to mine mine does not do that it, it doesn't do that um, I've just uh, I don't, and, and then I keep you know I'm watching videos of people traveling and, and talking about the things going on with their trucks new ones and i'm going i don't get that yeah i mean they got i mean the trucks are cool looking there's no doubt but i'm i'm telling you you know i'm knock on wood and, I, and the time will come and i'm going to be real sad when i have to give up my truck because there's nothing i've never had a truck as dependable and useful as the one i have now so anyway, I salute my F-350 2002 Ford diesel with a 7.3 engine. Well, since we've been on the subject of fishing, I do want to bring something up that's kind of interesting. And, and if you're not a fisherman, I apologize if I'm boring you to death. But um, it's kind of funny. It's like... You kind of go through life in your in the area that you live in, and if you're a fishing and hunting kind of person, you kind of get to know your region. So you got, you know it's not very obvious. I've made it clear that we're from the northwest. So I've learned how to trout fish, and I've learned how to uh, fly fish, and I've learned how to salmon fish, and and uh, halibut fish, and um, and then I also did crabbing and shrimping. So now I'm down here in Arizona. And I'm out in this lake, and uh, they there's tons of fish at this lake. And they got stripers, and they got small and largemouth bass, uh, crappie, uh, walleye, and some other stuff. I don't know all the species. And uh, I'm finding myself not having the clue of how to catch them. And so... What I've actually been doing this week, actually, is watching a lot of videos on Lake Powell, and, it, and it, especially the terminology fishing at Lake Powell, trying to learn how to use <laughs> what they call crankbaits and, and things like that, which I've never done before. I've never been a bass fisherman. But it looks like a lot of fun, and I'm kind of looking forward to giving it a shot. And so I guess um, I bring that up because, you know, I'm 55, and a lot of people, you know, they say, well, he's getting old, he's setting his ways. And it's like, you know, it's still a lot of fun to learn something new. And, uh, um, <laughs> I don't know. So, when it comes to RVing, I mean, you, and you start changing or moving around to different regions, and you have hobbies that you want to try, you'll find that you, how you did something in one region may be different in another. So you either have to be, you know, be stubborn and try your old ways and find out they don't work, or you need to learn something new. And uh, uh, just like podcasting, uh, I had a year ago, I didn't know how a podcast even operated, and now we've got a fully functional podcast, and 
uh, many directories and iTunes and whole works and is doing really well. And we started from scratch and we made mistakes and we had the wrong equipment at first, but you know, you just start diving in and before you know it, uh, you get a little coaching, find some good people to teach you. And there's so many resources on the internet. And that's another thing that's just amazing is there's a YouTube video on everything. I'm telling you everything. And uh, so learning how to fish down here in Arizona, um, it's going to take a little practice and I'm going to look like an idiot and <laughs> I won't be using every kind of bait and I won't understand why I'm you know, doing and and I'll probably catch fish and not really know what species they are. And uh, so, yeah, it's going to take a while. But uh, that's the fun of what we're doing. That's the fun of RVing. That's the fun of traveling. Um, change. And so I think that's a lot of people that really never get into RVing and traveling and thing is they just don't like change. And that's okay. I mean, it's nothing. People like pattern. Some people like the, you know, everything to be the same. Get home and the chairs in the same place and the television the same and the uh, yard is their uh, domain and, and they're just happy. And, and that's great because if everybody was out here, it'd be real crowded. But I just wanted to bring that up as, you know, um, uh, that's one of the things about RVing and traveling um, that really will open your mind and, and make you more spiritual in a way, too. And understand that this world or this even this country we have is so vast and so many different things. And um, one region's got different critters than the other. And... Um, you know, it's night and day from northwest where I live and down here of the critters and nightlife and and weather and everything. So I don't know where I'm kind of going with this other than the fact that if you have a hunkering for change, if you, uh, um, you have to be a little brave, but I urge you that if you get a chance to uh, start camping a little more or doing a little RVing or even just doing a boat thing or maybe just sailing and going to different regions do it and your life will be so fulfilled and always changing and stimulated it's i, I just think it's healthy for our minds and our bodies and uh, uh so bear with me as i learn how to fish um down here and i'll i'll tell you more about that and uh, uh learn a whole new region of lake, you know, like the Lake Powell area. Uh, I think they were saying that that lake is like 180 miles long. Are you kidding me? <laughs> that, I don't know if I could even cover that lake in my lifetime. So who knows? Um, and I'm sure there's going to be other endeavors going on. Um, you know, I, I kind of like to try uh, paddle boarding. I, can a can a fat guy paddle board? <laughs> Of course, maybe if a fat guy paddleboard, maybe he wouldn't stay fat so long. Who knows? <laughs> anyway, but yeah, um, change. Uh, always embrace it. Um, be grateful. Embrace change. Your life will be a wonderful. Well, I'm having a little problem with Cinder, our dog. And it's not a bad problem. Well, it's kind of a bad problem. I keep having a hard time finding her toys. So Cinder is a wonderful chocolate lab. She doesn't chew up uh, furniture or damage things or chew up shoes or anything. But we cannot give her any stuffed kind of toy. Anything that's got stuffing in it, Forget it. That that toy, if it lasts more than 15 minutes before stuffing is everywhere, uh, would be a miracle. And I, I got to admit, I just got back from the pro, uh, Bass Pro Shop. Yeah, that's kind of like Costco <laughs> and toy, toys, toys R Us. And I had to get some things. And uh, I saw this dog toy that I've seen them before and they were on sale for, for like $4.99. So I go, all right. It's stuffed, but it's made out of a real heavy uh, material. Um, 
and, and it might be all right for cinder. So I bought it. It's kind of star shaped and it has a stuffing in it. And it, you can, it, it can almost be like a frisbee or a boomerang, but it's got three sides to it. And it's stuffed and it's made of this hard fiber. Anyway, so I give it to cinder. She immediately pulls the tags off. That's what she does. And then I'm kind of um, working on some stuff for um, RV uh, Talk Radio, RV uh, Travel Buddy. And uh, I know I hear this kind of like rip, rip, rip. And she's got the seam of the darn thing. I thought she was still playing with the tags. And I hear this crack, you know, crack. <laughs> and she's literally stripping that outside seam from one end to the other. And voila, fuzzy stuff everywhere. And it's like... Are you kidding me? And I'm telling you, she did, I don't think she had that toy more than 10 to 15 minutes. And so I pulled out the stuffing and tried to tie it off. And I got it to last another 5 to 10 minutes with her. And she got to the other sections where the other fuzzies was. And I had to throw it away. I mean, literally, that toy did not last more than 35 minutes. I <laughs> It's like cinder. So, you know, the only kind of toys we can get her are these hard rubber things. And like like a Kong, if they're hollow, I can put peanut butter in them. And that's at 9 o'clock every night she wants peanut butter. And but so um, I had a rubber bone that had a hollow thing in it. It lasted about a year. But she finally worked that and cracked it and, and got that split in half. Um, but, man, she is just brutal on toys. And uh, there's not very many toys that I can buy her. Like, if you go to the store, you probably see, like, a gum, Gumby, that uh, green Gumby dog toy. Uh, she had the arms chewed off of that probably in a half hour time. And so all we have is Gumby with no arms and the legs she's not able to do. But she does have a Gumby, but no arms. Uh, <laughs> I just can't get her anything like that. I can't get her, like, a play duck. Because she'll open it up and get all the fuzz out of it. She's missing out on all the you know really fun toys that um, have squeakers and stuff in it. Because she's just once she's got that toy, she's got to work it and find the weakness to it and and crack it open. And she does the same thing with um, cheap tennis balls. You know, like those one dollar balls that you can buy at dollar store she can split those in half and have them tore up uh, probably in a half hour time um, I have to get her real tennis balls otherwise she can split them and uh, she's not a destructive dog it's really funny but I give her the wrong kind of toy she can demolish it and I'm, I swear Cinder should be a test toy dog is that, did I say right toy pet toy test dog <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, it's a, such a shame. I want to get her all these really cute toys, and I can't. And you guys probably have smaller dogs and stuff, and probably had the same squeaky toy all, for years. And Cinder, it would last, I, you know, it, uh, if it lasted a, even an hour, it'd be a miracle. But hard rubber toys, she's great and stuff. And like I said, she's not a destructive dog, but just can't have toys that, especially, I have stuffing in them. Uh, I don't know. It's a shame. But anyway, if uh, any of you guys uh, want to leave comments of, or leave me a link to like a, uh, some toys that you've gotten for your bigger dog that really lasted a long time, send me a link to where you bought it or whatever the toy is. And um, I just, I mean, I go to Petco or I go to and, uh, Pet Smart and, and I can look down that whole row and I can say, nope, she chew that. I can't give her rope. She will fray the rope, and not only that, I'll get a very colorful, um, uh, um, <laughs> let's say, since I have to do the pip poopy bag trick, I can tell that she's been chewing on rope. Let's put it that way. It would be very colorful. And uh, so that also kind of tells me it's probably not a good thing because she's eating the strands of the rope. But anyway, I can't give her, can't give her rope because it's a challenge to uh, tear it apart. Uh, so I, you know, I go, I look down these rows, and it's like, nope, 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 maybe, nope, maybe, maybe that, one, nope, should get that one. Oh, that's got a seam in it. Very, very few toys I can actually get. Um, she's got a like an elk horn. She, she, 
she's been had that forever. Uh, she's got like hard rubber, um, circular things like handcuffs. Um, that's worked all right. Uh, a conch, um, those little kind of ball type things that are hollow, and she likes that for peanut butter. Um, those are the kind of toys that she can have. Um, otherwise, she will demolish them. If I get those like loose rubber, rubbery toys that squeak, she, uh, if she gets a little bored, you know, she, you know, if we can keep her entertained, she'll kind of forget the fact that she could probably easily tear those apart. But she starts grinding on one of those, she can have those torn in half pretty, pretty quick. So like like a rubber d- dinosaur or something, it, it just ain't going to work. So anyway, yeah, love to hear your comments on that one. Kind of funny, and I just, you know, I, I took a break from the show to do this next segment and gave her this new toy, and it was like, how sad. I couldn't even get this toy the last 15 minutes. So anyway, yeah, if you got some suggestions about good toys for big dogs, uh, let me know. I'd appreciate it. For a moment or two, I'm going to be serious for a minute, and I want to address or talk about Sherry, my wife. And the reason I need to bring this up is, is we and I, I've mentioned it before, we just had, on August 23rd, uh, our anniversary, and we've been married 36 years. And it's been actually longer than that. We met at uh, age seven, and uh, believe it or not, in square dancing, and so we knew each other as children our parents knew each other i even dated her to take her to little movies at fifth grade and things like that and then we we're in junior high together in high school and we really didn't become a couple till we we're in late high school like uh, and uh we got married at 19 did not have children till uh 21 anyway and just our families were fairly close uh, my parents are gone but hers are still around and so it was kind of neat that her parents knew my parents and uh anyway so it's even though we've been married 36 years, it's been even longer than that. So, you know, I, I, first of all, you don't hear a lot of people being married over 30 years. 25, you might hear occasionally. But anyway, so what's the secret? <laughs> it's like, I don't know. I think one is, I mean, what, like when we met, it was just like, you know, um, like two magnets. It just seemed like it, we just fit together even through all the generational changes of being a teenager to being our 20s you know 20s are crazy uh having children all that and we keep adapting and uh um do we have hard times oh yeah um i mean there's been tough times we've been financially wiped out we've had sad things in our family uh i mean all the things that you know we've been tested um we've never had any problems like uh you know we've been um, as far as you know, we never had any uh, abuse or, or drugs or anything like that in our family, and our kids are, came out great too, and all that stuff. So we're very fortunate in that area. <laughs> um, I think the big part is uh, um, we're different. <laughs> you say, well, they must be a lot the same, and it's just the opposite. I am very. Um, um, I'm, I have a visionary type of guy, and Sherry's more analytical. When you put the two together, it kind of helps. It's very irritating for each other sometimes to have a vision, and another one's analyzing it to death. Um, but you got to have that. Um, visions are great to have, but they will need structure to become a vision uh, or reality. And so Sherry's always been my structure to make you know dreams come true. And then. She will, you know, I always tell Sherry, I hope when I'm, if I'm the first one to go and she's up on the podium, I just want her to say, wow, it was a fun ride. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's really all I want. It's like, she's always said that she's like the fact that I took her by the hand and took her on these adventures and she probably wouldn't have done it on her own. Um, She's more the kind of person we were talking about earlier that could have a patterned life and be perfectly happy. She's grateful for all the different things we've gone through. And then, and some of them cause disasters and problems, um, but all were learning curves. And uh, I don't have any big thing about um, how to stay married for a long time. 
other than uh, you always have to constantly work on communication. And even when you think you've got it down, you don't. Um, your thoughts change, your habits change, whatever. Communication is the toughest. And, and, and um, when I studied a lot of things about um, law of attraction, one of the other things is you can't make another person happy. Um, you, uh, you can assist and coach, but only you can make you happy. And so when you got to kind of learn that. It's up, it's up to you to make yourself happy. It's not your responsibility to make your spouse or other people happy. You, you can be a person to allow them to um, find out what that makes them happy, but you can't control that. Um, they've got to find their happiness. And so that's a hard one to comprehend, but it's a real true statement. Um, only you can make you happy. And other people are, you can't expect other people to, make, to do that for you. And I think Sherry and I kind of realize that, but it's really tough. So, yeah, if I had anything to pass on, I would just say uh, constantly work and adapt your communication skills with each other. Respect one another. Let each of you learn how to make yourselves happy and then allow each your partner to have their happiness, which may be different than yours. You may be a fisherman and a hunter, and they might be a puzzle designer chess player type thing it could be totally different but you got to give them the space to have their happiness and then you find the things that you have in common and then even like RVing sure he sees it different than I do boating she sees that different and so I allow her to do the things that she likes to do and those uh, activities um, and uh, uh, don't give her a hard time about it or vice versa she doesn't do it to me she knows i like to you know sit off the back and fish or do something and she may not like to do that she'll do something totally different but um we're still sharing the same space and, and enjoying the uh, opportunities together in our own ways um like i said you can't always make your partner happy you gotta let them it's their responsibility it's your responsibility to make yourself happy so anyway uh that's enough of that kind of stuff anyway i want to thank you very much for watching the show should i say listening to the show <laughs> i'm jumping between two platforms too much so i am grateful for you listening i am grateful for the comments we got some great comments last week and uh keep them coming and uh yeah uh, get me razzled up uh, that's you know, uh, but be polite i mean we're I, I, I uh, have total respect for people that might have something cr constructive to tell us, and we appreciate that. We appreciate you do it privately if it's something you really want to plow into us about. We also want to hear what we're doing right. Uh, I know this isn't the perfect platform. I'm not the perfect DJ. I'm Rob, and, it's, and Rob and Sherry, and, and we're sharing our lives with you. And so, no, I'm not the best speaker, and i got to keep working on that. And uh, I just want you to know we want you to enjoy being part of our family and part of our activities. And hopefully you enjoy some of our stories. And some of them will go off on a tangent and some will be dead on. Um, if one doesn't um, please you too much, I mean, please don't just leave and give up and stuff. The next video will be probably a totally different uh, subject or in the next radio show. And uh, uh, you'd be right back on board. But, um, yeah, we're, we kind of go all over the place. We're not predictable. And uh, hopefully every time you listen to the show, you go, I'm not sure what Rob's going to talk about. He's got me curious. I want to listen to the show. So uh, and sometimes I repeat myself and I go, oh, I guess I talked about that about, you know, 10 episodes ago. But uh, anyway, this is how it is. But once again, thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, we ask everybody out there, whether you're an RVer or a boater or whatever you do, to please be safe. Always think safety first. Um, and all these activities that we do do will always be fun when no one gets hurt. And uh, being you know, uh, pred you know, predicting things that could go wrong and, and having the right tools in place, having safety procedures and, 
and things like that um, just make all this so much more fun and and things do happen and if you're prepared for it not that big a deal so anyway take care we'll talk to you next week for episode 61 bye now thank you for watching our videos please take the time to subscribe and consider being a patron supporter there is many more adventures and some big surprises coming in the future with your help thanks again